Thank you very much for the invitation to speak uh, here. And also thank you very much for the kind um, introduction uh, which both of you um, gave here. Um, I will speak and I will, I will try to, to start with the title. Um, you already said something about the wordplay untimely contemporary. But uh, we have to face that in the last years, there was also, um, I would say, even an increasing discussion that Marx is not at all a contemporary, neither a timely nor an, an untimely. So there appeared in the last years two major biographies of Marx written by Jonathan Sperber an US-American historian specialized on German history of 19th century in 2013, and another big uh, biography written by Gareth Stedman Jones, a British um, professor for the history of ideas. And both more or less followed the same uh, thesis that Marx is a guy of 19th century and therefore he has not at all to tell us something in 20s or even 20s, uh, 21st century. Now that Marx is a guy of uh, 19th century, I would say it is not such a big surprise to hear this when you think that he was born in 1818 and died in 1883. Of what else century he should be a guy, but not uh, in, in 19th century. For me the question is, what is this century about 19th century? A lot of so-called modern structures emerged or um, had their breakthrough. The modern class society with uh, bourgeoisie and proletariat as main classes. Um, so-called modern um, political uh, structures. Central is the, the parliament and uh, the regular um, votings which shall give justification to the government. The economic structure of uh, an industrial capitalism um, had the breakthrough in 19th century. And even the first mass media Daily newspapers came in the 19th century, or modern communication, long before internet. What was the, the connecting communication breakthrough? It was the telegraph in the 19th century, and I would say this was a, a bigger breakthrough when you look to, to human history than internet. So, 19th century, which brought so many modern structures, was the century of Marx. Therefore, I gave to my um, biographical project the title Karl Marx and the Birth of Modern Society. Modern Society, a term which Marx himself used in the preface of um, Capital Volume 1, where he wrote, it is the last purpose of this work, capital, to reveal the economic law of motion of the modern society. If we really can speak of the modern society in singular, or if we not need uh, a plurality, I also will discuss in, in this uh, book, because uh, also Marx views changed and what I think is very important to follow this change, to, to see uh, the development of Marx. But uh, for the moment what I want to stress is that Marx in the 19th century was a witness of this enormous historical break which, which took place, but he was not only a witness or let's formulate a little bit different, as a witness, he played different roles. He was a very uh, committed political journalist all his lifetime. He wrote more than 1,000 
articles of different lengths. Then he was the scientist. This is the best known role uh, today. But also he was a political activist um, involved in certain organizations directly or uh, as an advisor. Um, and in these different roles, he put questions about the mechanisms of exploitation and domination, and also he put questions about the possibility of social emancipation and freedom. And I think the questions he put are still our questions today. Maybe we, we don't agree with uh, all of his answers, or we have to discuss his answers, but the questions he put on the table, they are still our questions. And in, in so far, um, I think we also need Marx in order to, to understand um, modern capitalism, and I'm strictly against the attempts of Sperber and Stedman Jones to abandon Marx with the argument, oh, he's a 19th century guy. But when I say this, at once I have to, to add an but. There is mostly what I have to say, a but. We also have to, uh, to, to be critical against the way of reading Marx which prevailed in the 20th century. I would say it was a very uncritical reading of Marx. It, is, it was an attitude of many Marxists in 20th century to accept, to accept very uncritically whatever Marx wrote, but not seeing how incomplete uh, Marx's work was. It is not a complete, comprehensive a verb on capitalism. It is a verb on progress. And this progress several times is interrupted. And this we have to take um, into account. When we look on the 40 years in which Marx was scientifically and politically active, more than 40 years, then we see not only one unfinished work, we really see a sequence of unfinished, incomplete works. It starts already with Marx's PhD, what seemed to be a rather remote philosophical essay on, on Greek uh, philosophy, or on a certain problem of Greek philosophy. But it was at the same time very political because Marx paralleled the situation in ancient Greek philosophy after the death of the great philosopher Aristotle. How should philosophy go on? And the German situation after the death of the great philosopher Hegel. How philosophy should go on? So what seemed to be a rather abstract theoretical treatise had a very concrete political um, point. And it should start a series of philosophical writings. But what happened? Marx not even could publish his uh, PhD thesis, and the other uh, planned uh, texts were not even written. And so the story was going on. Probably you all know uh, the famous economic philosophical manuscripts, uh, the Paris manuscripts of 1844 with the theory of alienation. This should only be the starting critic, a critic of economy. It should be followed by a critic of politics, a critic of law, a critic of morality, a critic of philosophy. They were never written. And also, economic philosophical uh, manuscripts were never published in Marx's lifetime. And so the story goes on. German ideology, or then coming to the critique of political economy, the six book plan, capital only book one of six, Marx published in uh, 1859 just two chapters 
known in English under the title A Contribution to the Critique of Political Economy. Then Marx again changed the project to Capital. Capital was not the first capital. Volume 1 appeared in 1867, designed to have four volumes. They never appeared in Marx's lifetime. His friend and comrade, Frederick Engels, published volume 2 and 3 uh, after his death. But, I will say at one uh, a little bit, it was not the original manuscript. <coughs> so, nothing from the, the main project of Marx was finished. And this has several consequences. Main texts which we read today are drafts. Drafts published after the death of the author. And they were published during decades. In 20th century, each generation knew a different mass. Lenin and Luxembourg, they didn't know the early writings of Marx. They didn't know the Grundrisse, the important verb between early writings and capital. So their knowledge, they, they not even knew the, the complete letters of Marx, which are very important not only for his critique of political economy, but also for his political um, judgments of, of the time. And so the story goes on. Um, and. Um, okay, this is the, the problem of, is, but this is only one problem of the drafts. The second problem of the drafts is that they were not published as Marx wrote them. The publication in 20th century were heavily edited. All the editors tried to present a nearly finished, complete work. <coughs> Of course, they tried to present what Marx would have presented. But we don't know what Marx would have presented. And in so far, they contributed to a kind of dogmatic reading. The, the editions were not exactly the manuscripts. They were changed. To give you just one example, when you, I, I just mentioned economic philosophical manuscripts from Paris 1844. In nearly all the editions, you will find a chapter called A Critique of Hegelian Dialectics and Hegelian Philosophy at All. This chapter doesn't exist in the manuscript. It was artificially produced that the editors took out several remarks which Marx did in several contexts in this manuscript about Hegel and put them together like a puzzle. Like, like a puzzle, I think, is the wrong English uh, uh, term. Uh, like, a mosaic, like, a, like a mosaic. But this, as a chapter, it didn't exist in, in the original manuscript. The remarks were Marx remarks, but you lost the context in which the remarks occurred. Um, <clears throat> some similar things happened with Capital, I will come back to this point together. Facing this situation with editions which are not really presenting Marx manuscripts, it is very important that since uh, the year 1975, a new big edition started, the so-called MEGA. It's an abbreviation for German terms, Marx, Engels, Gesamtausgabe. And I must say, even when, when you think it's so detailed and, and pedantical, but I must say, uh, just two sentences about this new additional project, which is not finished until now and which will need another 20 years, I, I suppose. It has two big claims. The first claim is really to present all the writings, letters, drafts, notebooks of Marx and Engels. Until now, nowhere in the world such a complete um, 
edition exists. It is designed for 114 volumes. The second uh, important attribute of this edition is originality. To, to uh, publish really what is left and not to try to, to present something nearly ready, what is not nearly ready. This means for published texts, uh, in, in this edition, all versions are published. For example, Capital Volume 1 is published in six different books, because there are six different versions in German, in English, in French. Everything is published. For the drafts, not only a text is published, also the changes did by Marx. <coughs> what did he erase? What did he insert? So you can really see the development. The complete letters are published, but not only the letters Marx and Engels wrote, but also the letters they received. Until now, there is only, uh, before Mega, only very less letters which Marx and Engels received were published. But a letter exchange is a real exchange. And you had only one side of the exchange. It's, it's a totally mess then. And big achievement, the whole notebooks are uh, published, not until now, not completely, but it is uh, the plan to publish them. And the notebooks are the intellectual laboratory of Marx and Engels. The Marx notebooks of the 1870s show in which way he tried to rework capital. What we read is not the capital, at least volume two and three, Marx really designed. We just read the state of, of the drafts, but his thinking continued and the design continued and such things we can find in the notebooks. So this new edition, it is really uh, a, an important achievement in order to understand Marx and my whole work, neither th this book nor this book would be possible without Mega. For some years I also um, worked at, at Mega. I also had the chance to, to see the original papers which Marx uh, wrote in, in Amsterdam, where most of them are uh, collected. Um, then I had to, to quit this work because um, I, I had too much jobs. I, I had to decide what I wanted to do. But now coming back, um, I, I close this point with Mega. Coming back, what I said at the beginning, that looking to all the, the lifetime of Marx, to all his works, we see a sequence of unfinished, incomplete projects. And of course, the first question is, why? Why nothing was completed? And here we have to think of um, an attribute of Marx's works, which is also very often underestimated or which is even neglected. What is this attribute? Even the most theoretical writings of Marx are at the same time political interventions to the political conflicts of his time, also capital. Capital is not only an abstract analysis of capitalism, it is an intervention to the conflicts, to the discussions of the workers' movement, of uh, competing socialist uh, um, designs, um, trying to give answers, to criticize others, and also to, to bring forward, of course, the analysis. So, for our understanding, of course, it is necessary to understand this political context. And this is one reason for my biographical work on Marx. Nowadays, many of these political conflicts are not very well known. We have to reconstruct them from history. We have to reconstruct 
the, the role Marx played in it. And this is not only a biographical question, it is at the same time a question for understanding the words. And by this also it comes out why we have this sequence. Because Marx was very often so strongly involved in political conflicts, he had to interrupt these verbs, the theoretical verbs, he had to interrupt in parts because he was thrown out from several countries. He had to leave Germany, he went to France, he had to leave France, he went to Belgium. He had to leave Belgium, he came during the revolution, 48, 49, he came back to Germany. After the defeat of uh, the revolution, he had, to, um, he had to, to escape from Germany, otherwise he would spend many years in jail and uh, the jail in, in Germany was uh, in this time for many persons a deadly place. Many of his comrades coming in jail, they died or they um, had uh, a lung infection. They were released but they couldn't enjoy very much um, their life after this. So Marx had definitely to escape. He escaped again to France but the Prussian Prussia was the, the most powerful state in Germany. The Prussian government chased him even in France and forced the French government to, to throw him out and so he had to go to London. What was for him a very bad place. He didn't speak the language. He had no chance to, to earn his living. But for his work, it was the best place. Capital as we know it could only be written in London because there were the sources, there were journals, there were economic newspapers. In France, of course, Marx could also write books, but never capital. In, in a time, not only without internet, a time without a copying machine, you must go to the books. There was no chance that the books will come to you in, in a certain form. No, you as a person had to go to the books. And <coughs> London, with the British Library, was the only place where capital could be written. So, all these conflicts, these interruptions, um, interrupted the work. When Marx then, after a while, restarted, also his scope, his horizon has changed. Marx was an enormously learning person. He never was satisfied with his own writings and he never wanted to publish anything where he not was, con not was convinced that's it. So he reworked. But when you rework something, you have no new ideas, new horizon, it is not anymore the same. It is not even uh, a continuation. The theoretical framework changed and he started new. But new conflicts came, new interruptions came. He had also to interrupt the work and when he started again, his views changed. A new rupture was the consequence. So, the life of Marx, the political conflicts of the life, not psychological speculations uh, about him, this I don't mean is the life, the, the real life of conflicts, of, of struggle, of fighting, this life in some respect is a key to the work. But on the other hand, also the work is a key to this life. The work brought new insights to Marx. The new insights concluded in new political strategies. New political strategies had the consequence that former allies were not anymore allies. And Marx had new alliances. So insights of the work also had an impact to the conflict of the life. So work and life in Marx is very interconnected. In the meanwhile, I would say you cannot understand the life without the work, but you also you cannot understand the work without the life. This is 
one reason uh, Sami uh, mentioned this, that I designed this as a four-volume uh, work. I have really to speak about uh, a lot of issues. And when we now, with this background, want to understand Marx, when we want to come to a new reading of Marx, a less dogmatic reading, a really critical reading, then, on the one hand, we have to take into account, on the one hand, the full Marx. What do I mean with the full Marx? On the one, not only Marx, the scientist, which is best known to us. We also have to take into account Marx, the journalist. Marx, the person who runs news newspapers or contributes to newspapers. And we have to take into account Marx as the political activist. The political activist who was a member in organizations or gave advice, especially in, in his later time, to um, the German Social Democratic Party. But when we take into account these different roles, then we have also to take into account more writings of Marx. Not only the famous books, the Capital, the 18th Primaire, or Civil War in France. No, the drafts, much more drafts than the economic philosophical manuscripts, for example. We have to take also into account the letters, the letters which, on the one hand, bring um, important um, reflections on theoretical matters, but also on political matters. And we have to take into account the hundreds or more than thousands articles. These articles, Marx mainly wrote for earning money, but they are deeply political articles. When very often it is said, and it is true, that Marx wanted originally to write a book about the state, but he never wrote this book. Some people come to the conclusion, oh, we miss the political theory of Marx. In Capital we can find the economic theory, but we miss the political theory. But a good part of the political theory is given not only in the two famous works, 18th Primaire and um, Civil War in France, it is also given in dozens and dozens of articles, of newspaper articles. Just to give you one example, there is a serial of 10 articles written in the 1850s about the Spanish Revolution, the bourgeois Spanish Revolution in early 19th century. And there is an extensive discussion about the role of constitution. What is the political meaning, the political uh, importance of a constitution, of uh, the, the character of a constitution, and so on. This article, they are known, they are published. But now by Mega, we know the, new, the, the notebooks in which Marx did his research. It is a thick volume in Mega. Marx studied a lot of literature on this. So these are not only a few articles written to inform the public and to earn some money. No, they are, by, uh, they are based on serious study. But in, in, the political, in the discussions about political theory of uh, Marx, such articles nearly never mentioned. So we have really to take into account to, to take it into account. Also, the notebooks I already mentioned, um, Marx's laboratory, they are especially important for the design of capital in the 1870s. Think about the simple chronological fact that cap the, the manuscript for volume three of capital was written in the year 1864-65. But Marx's research lasted until the year 
81 for more than 16 years. And he did research about crisis, about uh, credit and so on. All this research doesn't enter the manuscript, what we read as volume three. There are a number of, in part, uh, notebooks and specialized uh, manuscripts. Maybe when I have a, a little bit time at the end, I can, can say a little bit more, which can change very much our, um, our picture of, of volume three. So we must see these full marks and the full range of, of writings of him. But also we must see the historical background. We must see in, in which context he formulated certain notions. For example, Marx, since the late 1840s, speaks of political party, sometimes about communist party. When we hear this nowadays, with our 20th or 21st century mind, when we hear party, then we think of an organization with a program, with a chairman or chairwoman, with uh, a body, an administration and body. But Marx didn't mean this when he spoke about party. In these times, and not only for him, this was the usual uh, use of the language, party means something like a political camp. All the persons with similar political um, ideas, similar political intentions. When Marx wrote uh, in 1849, a contribution to the critique of political economy, this first small um, book on, on his critique of political economy, he wrote on a letter with this book, I hope to make a victory for our party. In the year 59, there was definitely no party, not at all an organization, the Communist League had uh, vanished uh, already uh, eight years ago. The first international didn't uh, exist in, in the year 1859. Nevertheless, Marx spoke of our party, meaning our camp. Persons we are affiliated, we, we share opinions. So this is very important. Or another example, what we have to take into account is the development of notions. Marx spoke very often, or not so often, but um, always from the year 43, 44, about communism. But he had not just one concept of communism. His concept of communism, his view on communism, changed during this time. And we have to, to acknowledge this, we have to, to recognize this, and not all visions of communism fit together. I said Marx was a learning individual, and he had no problem also to say, yes, something was wrong, I, I overcome a, a certain uh, view, and I have to reformulate it, to renew it, to, to improve it. And this we have to have in mind when we read Marx, and not only what unfortunately is done very often just to collect quotes. I have a certain opinion. Ah, there is a quote which can support my opinion. No, we have to, to look such a quote. What is the context? What is the development afterwards? And then we can, can use something and not like uh, um, someone who, who looks for a treasure. Oh, now I found, found a gold coin and uh, that's it. This is a totally wrong, uncritical, dogmatic reading. What is also important when we speak about Marx, of course Marx, I suppose for us who are here, 
is one of the most, maybe the most, uh, uh, political theorists, economical theorists, and maybe most of you would uh, agree that without Marx, we cannot understand capitalism. But Marx was not the only one. In, in his lifetime, there were a lot of other people with whom he interacted. He influenced them, but also they influenced him. In usual um, presentations, all these influences are mostly downplayed. Okay, there was a Hegel, there was an Adam Smith, there was a Ludwig Feuerbach, they gave some inspiration, but then this genius Marx did everything. I think this is a, a very wrong uh, attitude. We have to take seriously all these persons. We have to take seriously also the persons with whom Marx split. Just to give you one name, maybe not all of you know this name, Bruno Bauer. It was a so-called young Hegelian. I say so-called because I criticize here this notion, young Hegelian, but this is a different story. This Bruno Bauer, um, Marx had a split with him in, in uh, the years 44, or a clash with him, 44, 45. And there is well known one book, what Marx and Engels published, The Holy Family, the subtitle, Against Bruno Bauer and His Gang. It was a, in German a very negative uh, word. Bruno Bauer and his gang. Um, many um, biographies or even scholars on Marx's work see only this critique of Bruno Bauer and evaluate Bruno Bauer only from, from the standpoint of this critique. But for five years, from 1837 to 1842, Bruno Bauer was the closest personal friend of Marx, the closest scientific, he was in, in a scientific way closest to him, and he was the closest political ally. When we judge Bauer only from the later critique of Marx, we, we cannot understand how this guy for five years was so important for Marx. Therefore, we have to occupy this guy himself. This I, I did, uh, among others, in this first volume, to see that he was a radical theologian who has an, an enormous <coughs> development exactly in this time of friendship, that Bauer influenced Marx enormously, but also Marx influenced Bauer. For, for some years, they were a kind of dream team. And then we have to understand what are the factors uh, cause the split. And only when we understand all this, and also the tone of the time, the sound of the time, to, to really understand the clash or the formulation of the clash in, in this book, Holy Family, then we can <coughs> understand the whole case. But usually only the last act of the, the drama is received. Or to, just to say this about um, a more well-known, the German philosopher Hegel. Of course, everybody knows that Marx was influenced by Hegel. But what do we know about Hegel? Most persons, would, when, when you ask them, um, who was Hegel, what is the, the philosophical standing of Hegel, they would answer, he was a part of German idealism. In the year 2000, um, a very well-known German uh, Hegel scholar, Walter Jeschke, published a nice article with the question, when emerged German idealism? And his answer was, it emerged in the years after 1860. It emerged 30 years after Hegel's death. His thesis is, and I, I uh, agree to this thesis, 
that the notion, charm and idealism, <coughs> and what is understand with this, is a construction of the, of the history of philosophy writing in the second half of 19th century in Germany. I checked um, two encyclopedias of the 1840s. I, I used them to, to have an idea of the contemporary thinking of Marx's early years. And both encyclopedias under the entry idealism say, of course, Kant and Fichte were idealists, but Hegel and Schelling, of course not. This was the contemporary consciousness. And when we come with, with our idea, German idealism, it is a kind of anachronism. It is a reprojection of our constructions to the time. So we, we have to, to look what Hegel really was doing. Okay, this would fill another evening. I, I omit any more um, remarks on this. It's only a hint. Don't take anything for granted. Don't, don't take for granted what is Hegel, what is Feuerbach, what is German Romanticism. No, you always have to question such constructions, such names. Um, I speak already uh, very long, so I, I want to come to some results for a, a new understanding, for a new reading of Marx, um, which are results of this biographical project um, I, I have. One rather general result is a, a critique of a very mainstream um, narration of Marx's development. It is said Marx started with philosophy, then he came to politics, and then he understood that um, politics you can only understand when you go to the economic basis, and he was occupied, he occupied with economy. This understanding is supported also by Marx's autobiography. Marx's autobiography. Does anybody know Marx's autobiography? I'm sure many of you have read Marx's autobiography, but it was so short that you not even realize that it was an autobiography. It is uh, the first two pages of the preface from 1859 to a contribution to um, the critique of political economy. In these first two uh, pages, Marx refers to his own development. He says, originally, I studied law, but I was mainly interested in philosophy and history. Then, running uh, the Renanian newspaper in 1842, I was occupied mainly with politics. Then I learned uh, the basis of politics is um, economy. And I studied economy, and now I just present my um, big, or the beginning of my big economic work. This story, what Marx told, is mainly wrong. It is just a good marketing strategy. Marx was not known as an economist when he published this work. And he had to convince the public, I am really qualified to, to bring a book on economics to you. So he shaped his biography that it resulted in this economic work. Maybe you do the same when you apply it to a position. You shape a little bit your biography that it looks more fitting to the position you apply for. And Marx did exactly the same. But the readers believed. Already the, the starting is wrong. He said, I studied law in, in Bonn and Berlin, but I didn't do really. He did really. I checked all his courses, what he was learning. I, I checked the professors. He had a very sound um, education in, in legal matters. 
And you can even see this and in a lot of articles, uh, newspaper articles in, in this journal, in this uh, newspaper, the Renanian newspaper, had a strong legal background. And you, you can see that Marx knew very well what he was writing about when, when it came to the question of laws and the state changing laws and so on. And even in two times, Marx acted as a lawyer, a lawyer for himself. During the revolutionary period, 48, one time he himself was accused to undermine the state, and in the other uh, case, uh, the newspaper he ran, the new Renanian newspaper, was accused. And Marx did the defense by himself. Now, such a case for a leftist is very difficult. You are accused to undermine the state. Of course he was doing this, or he was, he was trying this. But what he shall say, yes, I try to undermine the state. Okay, case closed, prison. Or shall he say, oh, no, I undermining the state, not with me. Okay, his comrades would say, what is this? He, he betrays everything. What you shall do? Marx had a very clever strategy. He took the, the paper which accused him and he put off a lot of immanent contradictions of this paper. He also questioned the role of the state. He, his argument is very with, uh, filled with a, a lot of legal knowledge, turned the accusation and let the and argued the state is not allowed to formulate such an accusation. The accusation itself is illegally. And fortunately for Marx, in both cases, there was not only a judge, and the judges in this time in Germany, a lot of judges were rather liberal, but there was a jury, a jury of citizens. And in both times, in both time, Marx won the court. So, as a lawyer, he has a 100% success quote. <laughs> there are only a few lawyers who can say this. Uh, Marx can say this. So, his legal studies have really an, an impact, much more than, than Marx uh, admitted. Also, the, um, um, the other story he tells from politics to economics, it is not completely true what, what Marx tells in this autobiography, because Marx always was um, occupied with politics, not only with practical politics, also with political theory. This for, for Marx went together. His, his uh, practical actions he tried to found on a sound political analysis, and the political analysis needs political theory. After he came to London, so after 1850, indeed, his main occupation was with <coughs> economics. But still, he wrote articles like what I mentioned before, the serial about the Spanish Revolution, the question of constitution. So he followed several lines. And this counts for, for Marx always. He was not only occupied with one field of knowledge, with one issue. He always was occupied simultaneously with several fields of research, with several issues. And when the guy was um, tired and wanted to relax, what did he do? Either mathematical studies, or he translated from ancient Greek um, writers like Sophocles or Euripides in German. This was to relax, to, to have some free, relaxed uh, time. So, you must imagine him as someone, a, a kind of thinking machine, learning machine, uh, which nearly never stopped. Of course, he had to to, to pay a price for all this activity, the practical activity, the, the life which was very exhausting. When you see 
photos of Marx. There are only uh, a, a small number of photos. Um, you know the, the most important or mo most widespread photo marks with the bear, with the hair, mainly gray. This photo was uh, taken, I think, in early 1870s when Marx was in his mid 50s. From the photo, you would say it is a 70 year old guy, but he was in the mid 50s. And when, he's, when you see the last photo, which was taken in his journey to Algiers, for what a lifetime he left Europe, he came to, to Algiers in the year 1882. <coughs> it is a smiling face of a very old man, totally gray hairs, bare, the, the hair is not anymore long, you can see he lost a lot of hair. You would say this is a photo of an 80, 85 year old, go old guy. He was 63 when, when this photo was taken. So you can see this life had its price. It, it was very exhaustive. But okay, we, we have to see that he never stopped learning and, um, and really have to take into account what he did. So, Always several fields of research, not only one. And this leads me to, to another result, um, what I, I want to show uh, in, in this biographical research, or what, what is an outcome of it. In 20th century, there was a big discussion about the development of Marx if there is a continuity from early Marx, this is the theory of alienation, until the late Marx of uh, capital? Or is there a rupture? Is there a phys philosophical, maybe not fully scientific Marx at the beginning, and only after a rupture, a scientific major Marx started? Louis Althusser was a a strong uh, voice advocating this rupture. For example, many German uh, scholars denied this and um, stressed, <coughs> no, there is continuity. As a result of my um, research, I would say both theses are wrong. Neither continuity nor rupture. This may sound a little bit strange, because you may think either or, either continuity or rupture. One of the two must happen. And I say no, none of them. So what is my thesis? Against continuity, there are a lot of ruptures, and rupture meaning not only a soft development, but a new theoretical framework. But against the thesis of the rupture, against the, the um, um, contraposition, young, old, philosophical, economical, I say the many ruptures we find in Marx, you cannot reduce to the one big rupture or maybe to the two big ruptures. You have these many fields where Marx was working simultaneously, you have in the one field a rupture, and in another field, continuity. Then you have here a rupture, but here is continuity. Or you have a kind of intersection. So, Marx's development is much more complicated as it is just a line, and you can ask, is it a continuous line, or is it a line with a break? No, you have a whole field of intersecting lines with different, um, different ruptures. So the picture is much more complicated, but I must admit, much more interesting also. So this is the second, was the second result I, I wanted to indicate. Now I'm at the end of, of my time, we, we agreed. Um, if you have a little bit patience and, and can pay attention, I wanted to say something about capital, Marx's capital. 
um, you all know these three books. You can buy translations in many, many languages all over the world. Marx himself never saw these three books. This is clear for volume two and three, which Engels edited after his death. But it is also true for volume one, because what we now read as volume one, or what is translated usually as volume one, is the fourth edition provided by Engels. And in this fourth edition, he merged the second German edition with elements from the French translation, which has a big difference to, to the German. <coughs> so it is a merge of two different versions of Capital, and Marx never saw this merge. So we have the books. Now, thank Mega, we also have the manuscripts. And we have to distinguish between books and manuscripts. It's not at all the same, especially for volume two and three. But furthermore, I would add, we have to distinguish the books and the manuscripts of Capital from the project of Capital. The project Marx had in mind, Marx designed, Marx filled notebooks and letters with the project. <coughs> the project lasted un nearly until Marx's death, at least until the year 1881 and 82. He was very sick, he had big problems to work, but until the, the year 81, he, he was occupied with the project. And what does this mean? I, I come back to the case of uh, volume three. I, uh, or let, let me start uh, in another way. The three volumes of Capital are designed as a unity. Therefore, to, to the students, I always stress, you have to read all three volumes. Volume one is not only incomplete, it's even misleading you will confuse value with price. You will confuse surplus value with profit. You will miss totally interest-bearing capital and banking, what nowadays is so important, but it is a subject of volume three. So you really have to occupy with all three volumes. They are a unity. But strictly speaking, this is wrong. They are designed as a unity. They depend on each other like parts on unity. But when I look to the concrete books, they belong to very different periods of Marx's research process. They represent different results, uh, different, different levels of insight of Marx. Volume three, what is the important um, last stone of the whole analysis, as we know the book, rests on the oldest manuscript, on the manuscript written 1864-65. Marx's research continued. In the 70s, he was researching new forms of crisis. When his Russian translator, um, said, oh, when the continuation after volume one will come, in the year 1878, Marx wrote in a letter to him, I cannot continue until this crisis, this crisis will reach its top, because I have to consume it theoretically. He didn't want only some uh, uh, actual examples. He saw it is really a theoretical challenge, this crisis, and indeed it was the first long-lasting stagnation crisis. And it was also the first crisis with an international um, interaction, that the crisis couldn't come to an end, that it was on the one hand played down, on the other hand uh, prolonged, had to do with the interaction of different national banks with exchange rates and so on. This is not treated in volume three as we know it. It is treated in Marx's letters. So this is not included. 
And what is also um, not included, of course, in the 1870s, Marx had a new design for the chapter on credit and banking. The manuscript on the, from the 60s, the manuscript we know, um, takes the British banking system as the example, the empirical example for the theoretical analysis. In the 70s, Marx observed very closely, very intensively, the United States economy. And he wrote in, in his letters what in, in uh, Great Britain lasted, the developments lasted decades in the United States need only a few years. So when I will come to the presentation of the, the theory of credit and banking, I have to, to use the US banking system because until now it is already more modern than the British system. Also, he learned Russian in, in, the, in his 50s. He learned Russian language in order to read Russian economic literature because he saw that the landed property, the development of landed property in Russia was completely different from the development in Great Britain. So it was clear there is not only one way to capitalism, there are different ways. And maybe the outcome is also different. There is not only one type of, of capitalism. Also, in the 70s, he did the ethnological notebooks, and I would say this also um, is connected with a widening of his, um, of his scope. All this is not part of, of volume three as we know it, of course. And then my, my last point on, on capital, whoever uh, <coughs> occupied with it, knows, of course, the famous law of the tendency of the profit rate to fall. In volume three, Marx spoke about the most important law. Many Marxist scholars had fights. Can we really justify this law or it is not justified? In the additional drafts we have from late 60s and uh, 70s, there are some manuscripts about the mathematical relation between the rate of surplus value and the rate of profit. A long manuscript, 140 printed pages in mega, emerged in the year 1875. Marx, in this manuscript, said he wants to give a formulation of the laws of the profit rate. The laws of the profit rate. And the law of the falling profit rate not even appeared there. Obviously, Marx not anymore saw this law as a law of the profit rate. And the numerical examples he used, he also showed, of course, the profit rate can fall, but also it can rise, and it can remain the same. There, there is not really a tendency. You, you can see in capitalist development, everything is possible. And in his private copy, private printed copy of um, the second edition of volume one, Marx did this in his handwriting a remark that the profit of a capital with a higher capital composition. Capital composition is the relation between constant capital and variable capital. A capital with a higher capital composition, composition has a higher profit than a capital of the same amount with a lower capital composition. And this is exactly the opposite of the law. Engels very um, sincerely put this remark in a footnote. You all can read it in, in the usual editions of volume one. I also read it 30, 40 years ago. 
And I thought, okay, what does it mean? It is one small remark as a handwriting. There was, in these times, no other hint that Marx had doubt about uh, the profit rate law. And I thought, okay, I knew Marx in the evening, he liked to drink a glass of port wine and maybe a second glass. Maybe he drank one glass too much and he confused something when, when he wrote down this marginal note. But now, with Mega and with the other manuscripts we have, with this 1875 manuscripts about laws of the profit rate, profit rate, falling rate was not mentioned. I think it was not the port wine. He really meant what he wrote in, in this marginal uh, note. And therefore, I concluded, I only can conclude because there is not an explicit uh, expression of Marx, I conclude from the absence of um, the law in all the writings of the 70s, all the letters, in no letter, no manuscript, this law is mentioned. I conclude that Marx in the 70s abandoned this law. He accepted that we cannot justify this law, and he counted it not anymore under the laws of the profit rate. But in volume three, as we know it, it exists. And generations of Marxists fight it about this law. I think uh, at least Marx changed his mind about it. And this is one of these elements he learned. Um, OK, now I'm. I, 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 I can't end. At this, I, I spoke nearly one hour. Um, this is too much to, that you can follow. So thanks a lot that you followed me this, um, this hour. Maybe there is time for some discussion, for, for questions. I can do that additionally. So thanks a lot for your attention.